Hello. Hello everybody. Today I have a project-like tutorial for you. In this kind of videos I want to show you some practical and interesting uses of Astinter to peripherals and build a project or a useful tool along the way. Today and in the next video the peripheral of discussion will be timers and how we can use them to measure unknown signal frequency, period and duty cycle. For this project I'm going to be using timers both as a source for the test signal and as a measurement device. There are quite a few signal parameters that one can analyze for a given signal, like signal peak to peak voltage, frequency, period, frequency spectrum, duty cycle, average and effective voltage and much more. All of these parameters can be obtained with a microcontroller by using different peripherals in different ways. Timers sound quite boring, they count, and they can count the different speeds to different values and can be triggered by either software, hardware or other peripherals. At first glance this doesn't sound very useful apart from delays and timeouts that have we discussed before. The usefulness of a timer comes from all the features around it. Timer can work independent or can be triggered, reset and run by external signals. Timers can also include an additional input and output units called capture compare units. Now the timer can be more useful. Now you can look at the timer not as a timekeeper but as a counter. We, when we do this, more use cases emerge. We were using timers as counters before when configuring delays and PWN signals by adjusting auto reload registers to adjust the value to which the counter will be counting before reloading. By using these output compare modules, we were able to generate pulses and PWN signals by setting compare channels to trigger when the timer counted to a specific value. Input capture modules, on the other hand, work the other way around. They remember the timer counter value when an input trigger is detected. This is how we can measure signal period directly. I'm differentiating between measuring signal period and signal frequency. Although frequency is an inverse of a period and vice versa, some measurements measure directly signal period and others measure directly signal frequency. Each of these methods provide different advantages and drawbacks. When measuring with one of these methods, the other parameters can be obtained indirectly by inverting other value. So for the sake of simplicity and time, I will discuss today how to directly measure period. And in the next video, I am showing how to directly measure signal frequency. Now let me show you how we can approach measuring signal period on paper in theory so we can later implement it on our microcontroller. So there's a lot of things on this paper right now and I'll have it scanned and then linked in the GitHub page down below as always. So let's start somewhere. So let's go by this sketch on the right for the first. Over here is the schematic of a discrete uh, signal uh, measurement device like uh, frequency counter period counters from back in the day and we actually used one in school for this exact exercise and its schematic was kind of like this so on the bottom over here with F0 we have our local oscillator this is usually fixed at 10 megahertz you often see reference uh, oscillators at 10 megahertz this signal uh, goes then into divider is which is shown over here as 1 over KT and this expands the period of the outgoing signal or in this case divides the frequency of this local oscillator. Over here we have fx, our unknown signal with unknown frequency and unknown period tx. The both signals go into the gate and this gate will compare these input channels and then trigger and increment a counter. This is the way that actually counters back in the day worked. So how do we implement this in our microcontroller? So here we have a time diagram of some few signals. And the first signal is our unknown signal Tx and we're gonna use it to start and stop our measurement. So the first rising edge of the signal starts and the second one stops. We can also see the two different uh, paths that I also noted with the red dots over here. So it can end either here and here for some different examples. So it either can stop over here or here. On the bottom over here is our input signal of our local oscillator, so F0 divided by KT. So F0 divided by KT, giving us a period of KT times T0 over here. When the input signal comes with the first rising edge, it will also start reset and trigger our local timer. Our timer is going to start counting with Z amount of pulses. When a stop condition will come, the counter will stop counting. 
Now this top condition is asynchronous to the counter itself. The start is synchronous, but this end isn't. So we can see that the last pulse was over here, but the timer stopped over here, or maybe over here, or maybe over here. That means that we get some error over here, so we captured less time than we actually think. So we can see that this time is labeled over here as delta t. So if you try to uh, write down the actual input signal in a formula, it would be z minus 1 times kt times t0. So this is the time from the first pulse to the last one. So this is 1 kt t0, 2, 3, z minus 1 kt t0 periods. So this is the time plus delta t. So this is this time over here. And if we take this minus 1 out of here, we get the minus kt t0. And if we combine it with delta t, we get z kt t0 plus delta tau, where delta tau is delta t minus k0 t0. To visualize this delta tau and k0 t0, we can go on this graph with these dotted lines. Each of these dotted lines represents an area around one pulse denoting a period of kt t0. So instead, by labeling the period over here, we're going to label it symmetrically around each pulse. So plus kt t0 over 2 and minus kt t0 over 2. So as we can see, if we do that, we get a little bit extra time before the start. So a half of kt t0 and over here as well at the last signal. And because we're going to subtract k0 t0, one half will be subtracted over here. So this is not bothering us anymore and half will be subtracted over here. So now the total time z kt t0 is over here in the middle and two over here, but half has been subtracted. And now if we zoom into this area over here, so the last half can be subtracted, which is this one, which means only this little piece only remains. And this is the delta tau. So this is the actual error that we now get. So our measured period, so Ti, so this is the actual formula we will be using in our program to calculate our measured period, is z times the resolution, which is z times kt t0. So this is this time over here. And this time can be off by plus minus kt t0 half, which is the delta tau. So this is because of the asynchronous stop of the counter. The resolution, qt, is the resolution of the counter so how tiny we can differentiate different periods and this is denoted by the timer frequency period and its division so the higher the frequency of the timer and the lower the division the finally we can measure the period of our signal then many more pulses can get into one period of our signal now because we have always this little delta tau over here we're gonna get errors so let's see what kind of errors are this. And this is actually important to uh, understanding the drawbacks and uh, advantages of these methods and why I'm going to also talk about another method in the next video. To get the measurement error, EI, we can take our measured period, TI, and subtract the actual period, TX. And if we do that, our end result is minus delta tau. So this is the error that we get over here. So in this case, over here in this small portion. Our relative error limit, mt, is now the absolute maximum error limit. So this is the absolute error limit, which is defined by the delta tau. So the maximum value of the delta tau absolutely is ktt0 half, which means that our relative error limit is this uh, ktt0 half divided by the measured signal. And if we do that and convert tx into fx, so you can visualize it more, we can see that now our relative error limit, mt, changes with frequency linearly. It also changes linearly with our divider for our internal clock and with the period of our internal clock. So there's a few things we can gather from this. We want a high value counter for lower frequencies, because if we cannot count to a high enough value and if this period is very long, then our counter can overflow and we have to take account, into, uh, account those overflow into our equation. We also want a low kt, so we want a low division, which means that we want as much of the original frequency to go into our gate. 
Well, we want a low T0, but usually this T0 or F0 is fixed. Therefore, only the we want low KT argument is really needed. In this case, the low would be 1. Therefore, no frequency will be uh, converted down. So the original F0 will go here. So this frequency over here will be T0 times 1. We can also see from this equation that our relative error increases linearly with frequency. So higher the frequency, the bigger the error, which means this period gets shorter and gets really narrow. And then less of our pulses can get into one period, which means that this error is then more significant. If we can have pulses and this error can be maximum of half a pulse, we get a much smaller error than if we have three pulses and then half of a pulse can be the error. There, this way we can see that this technique does diminish with higher frequency. And we can also calculate when this does happen, at which frequency. Well, we can do this by taking this formula and turning it around to get frequency on the left side and turning the empty on the other. And you get the frequency max formula over here. Our arguments over here are now k minimum, which is one because we want as high t0 to get into our clock and our MT. MT is our uh, maximum reliable rel relative error limit that we allow. So let's say 1%, 0.1%, maybe 0.01% and we get our maximum frequency. And if we use an error limit like 10 to the power of minus 4, then our error limit calculates to 2 kilohertz. So the maximum frequency with this uh, s simple measuring uh, approach gets us to maximum 2 kilohertz. But if we get down to 1% of error, we can go to 200 kilohertz or 100 kilohertz reliably. There's an also another approach. We could also, in the next video, we will calculate our relative error limit for FMF by measuring signal frequency directly. And then we can equate MT to MF and we can get out the FX. And it turns out it's 2 kilohertz. Now to implement a period counter on your STN32, you will need one counter. But for our example, when we're gonna create a test signal, we're gonna need another more. So for one test signal and one for the measurement itself. We'll configure our test signal to timer to run and overflow at the frequency of one kilohertz and select the output compare to work in PWM mode at a counter value on one half of the total auto reload register value, thus giving us the PWM signal with a 50% duty cycle. For my microcontroller, so the STN32F407VG, I configured the system clock to be a round value so that I can divide it later to get 10 MHz. You have to look into the specification of your microcontroller to see what is the maximum core frequency and adjust it accordingly. For me, my maximum core frequency is 168 MHz and by selecting 160 MHz, my timer peripheral clock is 80 MHz. Thus, I can divide it by 8 to get 10 MHz. There are two ways to configure the measurement timer, manual and integrated. In a manual way, we have to configure some parameters. Select clock source as internal, as the timer will be running from the system. Then we have to configure it in slave mode, thus in slave mode option, select reset mode. This way, when triggered by a master control signal, the timer will reset itself. Then we have to enable the inputs. Select channel 1 and configure it in input compare direct input. For channel 2, you can configure input direct as well, but this will cost you an additional GPIO pin. We can also select indirect mode, in which channel 2 input will come from channel 1. We can observe this feature in the block diagram of the timer. This way, both channels will react to the input triggers from a GPIO pin, either assigned to channel 1 or channel 2, or both to channel 1. Then we just have to configure how the channels react. In the bottom, configure channel 1 to react to a rising edge, which is the default setting, and in the configuration for channel 2, to react in a falling edge. This way, we will use channel 1 to react to signal start and stop, and so to measure its period. And by using channel 2 to trigger on the falling edge, we will get the width of the signal pulse. Thus, we can calculate the PWN duty cycle. Now we just have to adjust some timer settings. To trigger timer to reset itself and start counting, we have to go to the trigger option and select TI1FP1. This way, timer's own input capture compare channel 1 will control the timer reset and start. This way, the rising edge of the input signal will start our timer and on the next rising edge it will reset, but before doing so, copying the timer's value into the capture compare register, which we can read. 
This way, we can figure out how many pulses has our counter counted in one period of input signal. By using channel 2, it will store the number of pulses that that timer has counted since start and thus giving us length of the signal pulse width. Now we just have to set the timer frequency. We have to configure the timer pre-scatter so the timer frequency will be 10 MHz. In my case, input frequency is 80 MHz, so the pre-scaler has to divide by 8, therefore the pre-scaler value of 7, since we're counting from 0, not 1. We want to leave our auto reload register at its highest possible value, so that we can count to as much accuracy as possible. We always want to have as much resolution, therefore desire to keep the counter as close to the auto reload register value, but we cannot let it overflow as that would ruin our measurement. Using a system with timer, our counter can count to 65,533 and at frequency of 10 MHz can capture signals of frequency 152 Hz and higher. By adjusting prescaler to 1 MHz for example, lower limit drops to 15 Hz, but so does the upper limit. Using a 32-bit timer, we can count to well below 1 Hz, therefore removing the need to adjust the timer divider KT. The easier way to configure the timer is using its integrated function and PWM input capture. To achieve the same thing, we can select the bottom feature called Combined Channels. Select option channel 1 to select input channel 1 to be master reset input. By doing this, lots of options gray out and we can see configuration added below. Our channel 1 is configured to be triggered on rising edge and trigger our timer in slave reset mode. It is configured in direct mode, therefore its input is connected directly to the GPIO pin. Channel 2 is configured for falling edge, so we can get duty cycle value and its input is indirect channel 1, therefore it comes from channel 1. With values of input capture channels 1 and 2, we can directly calculate timer period by formula, mentioned before, and calculate the duty cycle as a ratio of the length of pulse versus the length of whole period. Value is stored as a float or as integer, and we have to multiply the numerator by 100 before dividing by period length. We can also indirectly calculate signal frequency as an inverse of period. Note that frequency calculation accuracy is based on period measurement. Last thing is for our configuration is to select how and when to read the input capture data. Because we have discussed interrupts in our previous video, I will enable interrupts for this timer in the NVIC session. Go to NVIC session to confirm that interrupts for this timer is enabled. I like to lower its priority to at least one so as not to disturb any other more important function, although this one is pretty important because it's the core of our measurement. A word of warning. Because this timer will issue an interrupt every time channel 1 is triggered, we will have lots of interrupts in our system. Furthermore, this number of interrupts directly correlates to the frequency or period of our input signal. Thus, larger the frequency of input signal, more interrupts happen and less time it is for our main code to do work. For a more elegant solution, we should use DMA, but we will discuss this in a future video when we cover the DMA. For now, we have lots to learn and it's about time to implement just a few more lines of code in order to get our first readings. So now it's finally time for the demonstration. As you can see on the screen right now, I have my configuration on my desk, so I brought my oscilloscope and my signal generator, and I've used my signal generator before for testing, but it's not much different than the internal PWM testing that I'm uh, gonna be sharing with you, that you will also be able to configure even if you don't have a signal generator like me. So for this, we're gonna be using, as mentioned before, internal timer, in my case, timer five, for a PWM generation. In the demo program, we're going to be changing its frequency. So as you can see on the oscilloscope screen, the frequency will be changing from 500 Hz to 8000 Hz in a seconded loop. For this period counter uh, measurement device, I've created a library that I'm going to be sharing with you. And it's named the FP counter. And that's because I'm also going to be adding a few features for the frequency counter in the next videos that I'll be releasing. So I will be just updating this library and it will be then available on the GitHub in the embedded videos and as a separate library in my GitHub account. In here you will see three files for the fpcounter.c, fpcounter.h and fpcounter underscore config. And config is here to be meant so you can only interface with this one and don't have to touch any other files and just pretty much call the functions that are in here. And I'm going to show you about those functions right now. The handles uh, that are defined over here are for the timers that you'll be using. 
I'm using here two timers configured for measurement. So you can see frequency one, frequency two. They're basically the same because they're wired into the same input signal. I'm just testing the one, which is the timer four, which is configured the manual way and the timer one is configured the uh, integrated way. So the PWN input compare uh, input mode for the double pins. So if you're using HAL, then just define this one, HTM4, and you can also populate this one. So if you happen to use low level, this, fun uh, this library will also work with that. So it will check the timer4 macro over here. You're also going to be populating this one for your own signal generation and testing. So this is the handle for the timer that is creating the PWM and also the macro for this one. Now in the header file, we have firstly over here, we are checking whether the HAL is in use. And if it is, it's just defining the external time uh, timer handles for the handles that we mentioned before. So for the counter and the uh, PWN generator. Over here, we have some function prototypes and these that have underscore two will not be in your version of the code because these are just for my testing over here. So you basically have three functions, so the init, and this is going to start the interrupts and start the measurement timers. The PRQ, which will be the function that will be called in the interrupt routine, and this function is just going to copy the capture compare values. So as short function as possible. This function will be called whenever you want to get those data from those capture compare registers and calculate the frequency, period and duty cycle. It's using pointers because, well, you can just have your local variables in some other function where you might be uh, calling this one. So you're just giving the pointers to those uh, uh, variables over here. And this function will just work with those, not with its own local. The fourth one actually is the FP counter demo, which is just going to start the PWN generating timer. Now let's go to see where everything happens. Uh, firstly, I have some static variables over here. So as you can see, these that have underscore two will not be in your code. The IC1 and IC2 are going to be populated for the capture compare uh, register one and capture compare register two. So these are the variables that will be used to calculate the actual period, frequency and duty cycle. The dirty read over here is a bit strange. So this one will be used to ensure that the reading of data hasn't been tampered by the interrupt routine. So I'm going to show you later what that means. So the first function, which is the init function, as said before, is just going to start the capture and compare channels. Well, this function will start the timer itself, enable the capture, in this case, input capture compare registers. And then in this case, it's going to configure the channel one to trigger interrupts for this channel. And the channel two is just going to be enabled. So what this function does, let's click on this one. So this function just uh, enables the interrupt for this particular channel. So what we did in MX, we just enabled the NVIC interrupts in order for NVIC to be able to accept interrupts for this timer peripheral. So in this case, to trigger the on the capture compare register one. Later, this function also enables the input capture and enables the timer if it's not been enabled yet. And we're doing the same for the second one, but in this case, it's not enabling the interrupt for this channel, it's just enabling because when interrupts happen from the one first channel, we can just copy the data for both capture and compare register because it's going to be fresh for the both of them. So, so no need to trigger interrupts for both of them because that would be just too much interrupts. As you can see, we're checking if this uh, macro has been defined. So if you're using low level and no HAL timer library was found by ST, then this code will not be used, but instead we'll be using this one. So this one does the same, but because it's low level and I will discuss low level in the future video, it has to be more manageable. So firstly, we have to enable channels for both channels and then we have to enable interrupts for the first channel and then we can enable the counter itself. So this is all done by this function by itself. The IRQ function is the one that will be called in the uh, timer interrupt routine. So again, checking if it's low level or hull. And if it's uh, hull, it's firstly going to check if the interrupt is coming because of the capture compare one. So just to be sure. And then it's copying the compare value for the channel one into the IC one and to capture compare value from time uh, channel two into IC two. 
and setting the dirty flag one, meaning that it written new values in these registers. Now we're gonna see where this function is, uh, this uh, variable rather is important. If we go to the get data, so this is a function that can be called anywhere whenever you need new data. This data is also always gonna be uh, uh, updated and refreshed by the so the IC1 and IC2 will always be refreshed uh, when the input signal is present well as long as the timer is enabled but you can uh, calculate these uh, values for the period frequency and duty whenever you feel like it so you're not wasting resources of your CPU first thing we do we're gonna be using this do while loop so you don't see that too often but here it just fits the purpose so firstly, we're going to go into the do while loop and do everything that is inside of it. Firstly, we're going to set the dirty flag to zero, saying now we're manipulating data. Then we calculate the period, frequency and duty by using the pointers to the, fun uh, to the variables that will be provided. And then in the end, we check whether the dirty flag has been set. That would mean that the interrupt function, the IRQ function, was called somewhere from here to here and the data might not might be corrupted or in this case this data let's say it called over here which means that the period and frequency were calculated on a different set of IC1 and IC2 numbers than the duty cycle which means they are not correlated and not appropriate to uh, calculate this information and present it to be for the same signal at the same point in time therefore if this dirty value uh, read uh, flag is still at 1 then it's gonna go back into the do while loop and do everything again set it at zero and if no rq function was called while calculating this then the dirty flag will stay at zero which means we're gonna exit the while loop and exit this function so this is how this goes so it's uh, calculating new uh, new data over and over and over again until everything is fine we could also capture the IC1 and IC2 in the static variables in here, but this is the way that I just personally did and we also did and our professor introduced us to it. In the end we have the FP counter demo function which just starts the PWN generation for the counter timer that is for our demo program right now. Now to just implement this function in your program, firstly let's go to main and include this library in the main. Then uh, for my purpose I'm declaring it a few uh, static variables global over here and these are the ones that are being presented over here in live expressions. If you go down, the first one is it needs the FP counter demo and then it needs the measurement counter itself. In the middle I have a few datas and the one is the PWM frequency and this one holds an array of different auto reload register values for the timer PWN generation timer. So in this case 999 will create a 1 kilohertz PWN signal. That's because this timer was configured to have a prescaler of 80 which means that the input signal of the counter will be 1 megahertz. So if it counts to 1000 that means that the auto reload will uh, roll over every 1000 cycles which means it gives a 1 kilohertz frequency. A larger auto reload lower the frequency so 1000 kilohertz 500 hertz 1000 uh, 2000 4000 8000 and back 4000 2000 1000 so this is gonna be cyclic and over here i'm using the counter uh, variable i to ensure that i'm always inside this uh, register so i'm just checking if it's not over the size of this array and then if it is i'm gonna set it to zero over here I'm setting new uh, setting for the PWN generator, so in here I'm setting the auto reload register to one of the values from this array, and here I'm setting the compare register for this timer from one of these auto reload ver uh, registers uh, value divided by 2, so it always stays at a 50% duty cycle. Then I'm calling these get functions in order to refresh this uh, number so you can see they're refreshing every one second that's because I'm also toggling uh, GPIO pin for an onboard LED and then delaying for 1000 seconds. In order to get new IC1 and IC2 values we also have to implement those RQ functions somewhere so let's go into our interrupt function so it's underscore it.c where you're also gonna include your library 
and then go to the particular handler for your counter that is used for your measurement. So in this case, timer four is the primary one. So here I'm calling the FP counter underscore P underscore RQ function. So this one, so this is the function that will uh, get the new IC1 and IC2 data whenever the interrupt gets triggered. And I'm also gonna be using, let's go back, the timer one, which is the second one, which has been configured the easy way and it's gonna using the underscore two. So this one you're not gonna be having. So this is all. Uh, I'm gonna include this uh, list of what to do, how to implement this library as well in this header file over here. So there will be some kind of instructions over here. But if you're confused still about a few things, just roll back in the video to the configuration or maybe the paper explanation. And then I'm sure that everything will be clear to you. So until the next video, when I explain how to do the frequency counter, all the content will be on GitHub as a, a, a standalone library and as a library inside my embedded uh, work case. So thank you for watching and I'll see you the next time. Bye.